Hello and welcome back to The Drag Detective, where today we are going to be talking about Canada's Drag Race, Canada vs. The World 2. I went into this season not really having high expectations. I was just really annoyed that the cast was almost entirely focused on RuPaul-led seasons or English language seasons only. I guess I should not have been that shocked because season one was the same way. But knowing that we had global all-stars coming, UK versus the World 2 just ended and that had some great, or I guess greater international representation. It just felt like, what was the, why are we doing this? Why, why are we doing this? Uh, so going in, I had my doubts and I must say, all of my doubts have been squashed, they have been obliterated, they have been annihilated, and this could be, we'll see if they can stick the landing, this could be my favorite season of 2024. So I'm going to go through all the reasons why this season is working, all of the decisions that production is making that are making this an incredible season of Drag Race, and we will dive into all of that. So without further ado, the first thing I want to talk about is cast dynamics. That was the big complaint about this season. It was, where are the Thailand girls? Where are the Sweden girls? Where are the Mexico girls? Because everyone on this season is either from Canada, the UK, or the US, with the exception of La Cajena, who is the pork chop queen from France, which was just kind of like a strange choice. Like if you're gonna have one queen from a non-English speaking country, why is it a first out? I'm wondering if Global All-Stars, with that going on, if they kind of put a pin in like, don't take people that we can use for Global All-Stars. And maybe that is where some of these casting decisions like led to, but it was very interesting. Before the cast was officially announced, before the promo dropped, any of that, we knew who the cast was when they filmed and it was just very, okay, I guess we're doing this. Because another thing, about this cast is there are so many people who are on their either third or fourth time competing. Because previously, the only person who's competed four times is Juju B. But with this season, now we have Alexis Mateo and Jerika joining that list. We also have Kennedy Davenport, who has been on twice already. And the real, like, what is happening casting choices for me were the choice to have both Cheryl Hole and Lemon on. And as we know, Cheryl and Lemon both came back for UK versus The World 1. They were the first two outs of that season. And while people were very sad because they're, you know, both fan favorites, so it's actually a huge outburst of angry fans about Lemon's elimination in particular, I don't think that people were like expecting them to come back to like a versus The World season. Like I could see Cheryl on a, on a UK All-Stars, I could see Lemon on a Canada All-Stars, but coming back for another versus The World, I guess because it hadn't been done yet, it just felt very strange. And not only that, but like the UK versus the world didn't air that long ago. Like it was only like two years ago at this point, maybe three, I'm like, time doesn't exist, who, who freaking knows. But they were like just on. And really a lot of these queens were just on. So the fact that it was a very modern leaning cast, a lot of these queens had just been on seasons. This was like their third or their fourth time. It was just very like, okay, then what is the point of this? We didn't see the vision. Now I see the vision. I completely now see the vision. While I do think that it's very similar to All Stars 4, where the first three outs are very obvious, no shade, no shade, but the first three outs, if you had to guess going into the season, you would have gotten them right. That still leaves a very strong top six, one of the strongest top sixes of all time of any drag race season ever. It's filled with so many legends. I mean, Kennedy Davenport and Alexis Mateo are like two of the most well-respected and like paid their dues queens in Drag Race history. So to have them both on is great. Lemon is a huge fan favorite. Fierce Delicious is a gigantic fan favorite. This is a very, very top heavy cast, but the people that are at the top are so good and they're so good at making TV. They've done this twice or three times now. So they know exactly what production is expecting of them and what the fans are expecting of them and how they can make this a good season. And I think that is truly why this is a good season. I think a lot of times, I think a lot of queens who are on their first time or their second time, they're worried about the edit, they're worried about what the fans are gonna think, they're worried about production, they're worried about all of these things. But the people who are on three or four times, they know the production loves them because they've asked them back this many times. They know the fans love them because production is willing to give them 
a slot on a season and they know exactly what they're there for. So I think it makes sense that the people who are here this season know what they're doing and are making great television. I also just think the cast dynamics are incredible because you have so many queens with prior friendships and it's almost like a web of like how these queens know each other. You have Lemon and Cheryl who were the first two boots on UK versus the world and kind of bonded through that experience and have become really good friends since then. You have the Canadian girls, you know, Tainomi and Fierce and Lemon, who are three of the most, you know, famous Canadian queens of all time. And they obviously have a very tight bond and know each other and have worked together. Kennedy and Eureka and Alexis, they're all pageant queens. They've all done the Drag Race live show in, in Vegas. They all know each other. And specifically Alexis and Kennedy are very, very good friends who have worked together for years and years and years. So those are some bonds that are going to come into play on the season. I just think there are so many interesting friendships and dynamics and ones that even form in the workroom. You know what I mean? Like Fierce and Eureka is so fun. And you had like Eureka and La Cajena in the premiere. Like you just have some really, really good dynamics on the season. And it feels like everyone is there to make good TV and make a good season and show off their best drag. And that's what leads to the best all-star seasons. Not the people who come back because oh, I want more followers, or I want a better edit, or da 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 The people who are there, like, let's make a good fucking season. That's when we get a good fucking season. Another thing about this season that makes it just, like, so good is the challenges. They are taking so many risks and doing so many interesting challenges this season. I have fully, fully enjoyed all of them so far. Starting off with the girl groups, which is, like, not a unique challenge by any means, but sometimes it can get boring when we see them just do the same song three times and, you know, it's like, okay, I'm bored now. But we had three different songs in the premiere. All three of them were good. The quality was there. They weren't, like, you know, flop songs. It was a great start. Then we had the Traders Challenge, which was so, so good. That is one of my, that might be my favorite episode of Drag Race of 2024. As a reality TV fan, as like, I love Drag Race, but like Survivor, Big Brother, Traders, like all of that is like my also like love. It was so fun to watch them come together and it was just done so well. The production quality was there. Lisa Renna being there was random, but it was so funny. Everything about that challenge was perfection. Then we have the AI ball, which I know a lot of people didn't like. I thought that it was fun, I thought that some of the categories were really great. I think the third category could have been like something different like, to make it more like tied in or to give them like a more focused prompt. But I thought that the AI like art looks were so fun. And obviously the robot looks were all iconic. So I thought this was a really, really good ball overall. And then this roast battle was so random, but I really, really liked this format. I'm not on Twitter. I don't know what the general vibe uh, is of like what people are thinking about these past couple of episodes, but I really, really liked this. I liked that it was like a head to head. The person who wins is in the top and the person who loses is in the bottom. It makes for very high stakes and makes for a very clear like, here's what is going to happen. And I just really, really liked that approach and the way that that challenge played out. I really liked that challenge and I thought it was a great way to switch up the regular roast format that we have seen 40 times now and is somewhat getting stale. And then next week, I don't know what it means yet, but we're getting Snatch Game The Rusical. <clears throat> Which, you know, are they going to pick characters? Are they going to be playing, you know, pre-made, pre-selected people? Like, who knows? But I'm just excited that they're taking risks and they're flipping some of these very kind of worn out, tired, we've done these 40 time challenges, and they're bringing new life to them with these new concepts and new ideas and new ways to play those out. Not only just the maxi challenges, but Canada always has really good mini challenges and this season is very much that. Having to lip sync to just what they want, whether like throwing garbage in their face or having them pretend to be like motion capture, like it was, we've had some really, really good mini challenges that don't feel like, okay, that was a waste of 10 minutes of my life. And when you can tell production is putting in the work to give the queens, you know, interesting, new, fun things to do with their drag, that always makes for a good season because it's switching up just the regular roast, snatch game, girl group, like the same things that we see every single season. I also think that the judging has been pretty fair with a couple exceptions. The first episode, 
I think was totally fair. The second episode made total sense. The third episode, I feel like Lemon probably shouldn't have been in the top. I think Eureka could have been in the top over her, but that was just a one high placement. This past episode, there was definitely some riggery and I will be talking about it in the Riggery video. But like overall, I think the judging has been pretty fair. And I think with the format, which we will get into in a second, you have to have fair judging. Because if people who, you know, should have been in the bottom are winning challenges, or like people who are in the top or like in the bottom, like it makes for that, I don't think that format would work if the judging was that wonky. I think there has to be very clear judging that the queens can truly like be like, yes, I can see where you were coming from with this. And I can make good decisions based off of that. I truly think the only queen that is getting any type of favoritism is Lemon. I think that very much they wanted to prop Lemon up. I wouldn't be shocked if Lemon won the season. I don't know spoilers, I promise. But to me, it just seems like of all the queens, Lemon is the one who has the like winning storyline. And she also is the one who might be getting a little bit of favoritism here and there. But besides Lemon, I feel like everyone else has placed pretty much exactly where they should have. And it makes sense in my fantasy. And that's why, like, the first three going home, like, it's sad. It, but it's the same with, like, Jasmine Masters and Gia Gunn and Pheromone. Like, it felt like their time. It didn't feel like, oh, they casted them just to be an early out and then they sent them home. Kind of like Serena Cha-Cha. It, it felt like La Cahenna and La Phil, as much as it broke my heart, and Tainomi Bakes, like, it felt like that was a fair moment for them to go home. And I wish they could have lasted longer. I wish they could have had their moment on the season to really like make their stamp on Drag Race. But I can't say that their eliminations felt unwarranted. And you know, that's another thing about this season is like UK versus the world was so hated because all the eliminations like stung. Like we hated seeing Lemon go home first. It sucked seeing Cheryl go early and not like prove herself. And then Jimbo and Pangina going back to back. Like it was just like too much and it didn't make for an enjoyable experience because you weren't satisfied at the end of any episode. This season, I feel like every elimination has made sense and I am satisfied at the end of every episode, even if some of them do sting more than others like LaFille, who was someone who I was so excited to have back. I loved him on uh, UK4. I thought that he was so overlooked on that season. And while he had a great start in the premiere, that was a pretty rough Traders episode for him. So like it stings, but I'm not like, fuck this show. You know what I mean? I also feel like, and this is kind of going hand in hand with the casting, is the editing and the storylines have been top fucking tier. I am editing a drag duel season as we speak. And it's really, really hard to keep up with storylines and figure out, okay, what is this person's story here versus here versus here? Like, how can we follow their narrative in a satisfying way. It's very, very difficult to do. And this season is doing it perfectly. It's actually inspiring me. I'm like, this is, this is how you do it. Take Eureka, for example. In the first episode, she's like, I'm a pariah here. I'm not close with Alexis or Kennedy. Those two are like a clear duo and I'm on the outs. I don't know any of these queens, but I can focus in on La Cahenna and she could be my like ride or die in this competition. And then La Cahenna goes home first. Eureka has to send her home. It's not rigged. It plays out very naturally. And then for the rest of the season, we see Eureka starting to build bonds with other queens like Fierce. And as she's doing that, we learn that Eureka is in a very different space than she was in her previous seasons with her sobriety, with her transness. And in the episode where she goes home, you know, it kind of, a lot of people are like, why is Eureka not doing as well this season? And we learn why. We learn that this this competition setting is not conducive to a positive experience for Eureka and the place of her sobriety at the moment. And she kind of accepts that like, you know, this is probably not where I should be right now and I can accept going home. And it feels like we see her narrative, we see where she started and where she ended. And she even comments like, I came in here feeling so alone and now you all have made me feel so loved. So while it's crazy that Eureka goes home halfway through the competition, for being such a legend of the show, the narrative tells us exactly why that happened and makes us feel somewhat good about it because Eureka is at peace with it and it makes us feel at peace with it. We also see Cheryl and Lemon who come in with kind of like big chips on their shoulder about UK versus the world. And for Cheryl, I mean, even her first season and how they just want to do well. And we see that both of them have been crushing this competition. Cheryl did have a fumble in the AI ball and they really made you think she could be going home. Like they really put the work and effort into that storyline to where Cheryl going home would have been devastating. Like I was ready to cry. My mother was texting me like, 
if Cheryl leaves, I'm literally gonna start crying. They put the work into Cheryl's narrative so that the moment when she could be going home, she's up against a lip sync assassin in Tainomi Banks. Your heart is pounding. You're like devastated already. You're like ready to accept that like, fuck, this is going to happen and it's gonna sting and it's gonna suck. But then she wins the lip sync. She's in the top the next week. And it's like, that is the bitch that I have been wanting since day one of UK One. She's here, she's slaying. And it just makes for such a good storyline. It makes for such a good redemption arc. And redemption arcs is what makes good TV for All Stars. That's why All Star 6 is such a good season. It's the season of redemption arcs. We're seeing one with Cheryl. We're seeing one with Lemon. I think Kennedy is somewhat having one with just her reception of the fan base, you know? Like, she used to be so hated, so hated. And now I think people truly understand Kennedy's intentions, Kennedy's humor, Kennedy's, you know, spitefulness at times. But they love her as a queen. They love her drag. And we fully see, like, the entirety of Kennedy Davenport on this season. And, you know, if this was five or six years ago, she could be getting hate. But this season, she's getting propped up, and it's just so good to see. The storylines of the season are literally top-notch. Fierce <laughs> being, like, the stirrer of trouble and chaos, but then finally kind of coming to a place of, like, understanding where everyone else is coming from, understanding where the judges are coming from, and proving her worth, proving why she deserves to be there in that lip-sync against Eureka. This is stuff you can't just, like, write. You know what I mean? This is stuff you can't just, like make up out of thin air with an edit like this is like truly they looked at what these queens were going through on that set and said we are going to do our best to translate that perfectly to the television and they did that and that leads to our last point and I think the one that truly is like the je ne sais quoi of the season it is the it is the, I almost said the angry beaver <laughs> not the Nicktoons the golden beaver which I loved this twist on Canada 4 I would just prefer to see this on an All-Stars. Like, I think this should be the go-to All-Stars format. It is perfect. It lets the queens who are in the bottom fight for it. We don't end up with shitty lip syncs because people in the top don't care about winning and getting the power to, to snip or whatever. Like, it just leads to so much drama that feels warranted. And the drama doesn't end when the lip sync starts. Like, we then are, like, shocked. Like, we're then just like, oh my god, who is going home? Because with the lip sync for your, the, your legacy, like top two format, it's always clear. It is almost always clear who is going home. And it doesn't matter who wins the lip sync because they're probably both sending home the same person. There's probably, I can probably count on one hand the amount of times where the queens picked different lip syncs, especially after All Stars 2. So there's no tension during the lip sync because we already know what's probably going to happen. With this, we are in anticipation of who's going to use the beaver. Then we're in anticipation of who's going to win the lip sync and save themselves from going home. It is just such a good, good format. I did a fantasy season with this like five years ago and people were like, wow, I didn't come up with it. I mean, I heard about it from somewhere else and I implemented it, but I just remember the comments on those videos being like, holy shit, this would be so much better than what we're getting. And I'm like, yes. And now that we're getting it, it is just like, this is perfect. This is perfect. And it took Canada to like put the pieces together and be like, this is the ideal All-Stars format. All of the lip syncs have been great. It's not always clear who's going to get the Golden Beaver. I think it makes for more drama, a more dramatic experience. And especially in this last episode, it's going to be like, who are you going to save? When almost everyone has been in the bottom now at some point. It's just so good. I'm so glad that we have it. And I just love this season so freaking much. Like I said, I'm not on Twitter, so I see some stuff on Instagram, but like, I don't really know what the temperature is of this season from the fandom in general. So I would love to hear your thoughts. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me and think I'm delusional? Let me know what you think. And let me know who you are rooting for, for the crown. Uh, so sorry for the video last week not being posted. I lost my power for six whole days. Uh, which was horrible, but luckily I had a bachelorette trip this past weekend, so I only had to deal with no power for three of those six days. But it was it was wild. We have the power back. Cleveland is being rebuilt tree by tree, brick by brick. Yes, there was a tornado forming in my backyard. It was wild. But I want to thank you all so much for watching. The All-Stars 9 unrigging, I'm unsure if I want to do it. I feel like there's so much nastiness around that season. 
I don't want to put out a video that just gets more nastiness, not even just towards me, but towards the queens on that season. Like, I, I don't know if I want to fan that flame. So I might put it out in a couple weeks, maybe next week. I don't know. I just don't want to be someone who is like stirring the pot when the pot doesn't need to be stirred any longer, if you know what I mean. So we'll see. We'll see about that video. But in the meantime, we have this fun season to talk about. Global All-Stars is about to start and Drag Duel is getting closer and closer. So make sure you subscribe to me so you don't miss any of my videos. And I wanna thank you all so much for watching. The links to all of my social medias are in the description below. And I will catch you all in the next one.